We're in uh, second lessons of Philippians chapter 1, and it's going to talk about blessings and growth here. Uh, Philippians 1, and uh, let's just uh, uh, read the first couple of verses here. It says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank uh, my God upon every remembrance of you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the uh, Bible. Thank you for the chance to uh, just study about the Philippian church in this book of Philippians. I pray now that you would give me your words, and I pray you'd speak to our hearts, and we would uh, grow in grace. We would grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we would, uh, um, Lord, we, we just have limited time on earth, and we're preparing for eternity, Lord. We, every lesson, every service, we need truth. Uh, we need to grow, and I pray you'd help us and speak to our hearts. We thank you for the Bible, and I thank you for all that it uh, gives us uh, for uh, life and godliness. Please uh, give us truth and speak to our hearts. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for everybody who's here today, and I pray you use this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, just a few things, and uh, first of all, we see in uh, verse 1, it's a message for the whole church. It kind of lists the groups in the church there, uh, Philippi, and it said, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, and then it lists who's in the church. To the saints, that's the laymen, the people in the church, in uh, the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. And uh, so we just kind of see that there's three groups of people. The, 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 the bishops, which is the overseer, is, the, is what the word uh, means. And uh, uh, pastor is the, is the word we use. It's just uh, with the, in, from Ephesians 4. And deacons, deacons are servants. And uh, so... Um, we see three groups within the church. It's for the whole church. And uh, that's, uh, it just says, hey, this is, uh, this is for you. This is for everybody. And, uh, and uh, for the whole church to learn that. And that's, the, that's a good thing about church. This church should be everybody learning. It's not a bunch of subdivisions of uh, people who, uh, who are just people who, who are just people who attend. But everybody should learn. Everybody should hear the message. Everybody should grow. And every one of us should be uh, growing in Christ. And no matter what our position in the church, whether we're a pastor, a layman, a deacon, whatever we are, we all just need to follow the Lord and, uh, and uh, grow and learn the things he's going to teach here because he's going to teach a lot of key things to the Christian life. Um, this church, uh, oh, well, it says, Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. This church was a blessing to Paul. We talked a little bit about that. But, uh, you know, I'm so glad about that because if, you, if you're familiar with the New Testament, uh, man, you, you see Cor the Corinthian church and what a bunch of burdens it was. The things he heard about and the things that he had to straighten out and he had to say to them, look, should I come with a love or should I come with a rod? Because we got to straighten this thing out because the church is such a mess and, and, and the, 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 the unsaved are speaking evil of you and it, you're, you're so immoral and things like that. And uh, Paul said, I got to fix this stuff. And the Galatian churches, he said, I'm afraid I've labored in vain because you're all going away from the gospel to another gospel. And uh, the burden, uh, you know, even in Hebrews, he says, look, you, you have need. They won't teach you again the first principles. And, uh, and, and you're standing in need of uh, milk and not meat. And, and uh, so, many, uh, so many problems in, uh, in these churches and uh, contention in Romans and, uh, you know, over eating meat and other things and, and uh, just a lot of uh, uh, problems. And yet this, there's this church here that was just um, a blessing to him. I thank God upon every remembrance of you. And, uh, and just uh, understand that. That's an important, and, and I hate to say this because it, it applies to me, but it applies to every parent, it applies to every spiritual leader, is understand that with your leaders, you're either a blessing or a burden. And I think that's uh, one of the things most people think is leaders are indestructible and leaders, well, that's their job. Um, but leaders are humans. And you understand that our bus workers go out there. They don't understand. The kids don't understand when they don't come. The bus workers care. And, and, and when they backslide and and when they do things, and it affects, it's a burden on somebody else. When children are bad children, all they think of themselves, well, this is fun, or I want to do this, or my parent, they don't understand they're a burden. They're a burden. 
And, uh, and so understand, you want to be a blessing to those who lead you. Um, because understand, you know, you say, well, I'm tempted to have my own problems. But understand, as a leader, they have their own problems also, but the responsibility is all of your problems also. And the problem is, when not just they're car carrying your burdens, but you're a problem. <laughs> and they have to carry, they have to lift you up. Because you're, and I, I'm not saying a new convert. Look, we don't mind. We all lift the new converts and make that. But when you ought to know better, and they're still lifting you up. When they're trying to, come on, come on, go soul winning. Come on, go, make sure you're at church every Sunday. When nobody should have to tell you to be at church every Sunday. And, and, and when you should be carrying the load, but they're carrying you. And, and what does Paul say? He says, I thank God on every remembrance of you. You're such a blessing to me. And uh, that's a great thing. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, making requests with joy. Now that's interesting because when we pray, sometimes we're praying for bread at midnight, and and sometimes we're praying, uh, and we're praying for somebody to come out of sin, and we're praying for this person's life to be built, or them to come back to the Lord, or for uh, 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 their burdens, and, and that's good. We ought to bear you one of those burdens, and that's all good. But Paul says, I pray for you. I pray with joy. You know, it's a big difference of praying when you say, Lord, keep them going like they are and keep them strong than when it is, Lord, discipline them. They need to come back to you. You know, it's, it's just a different way you pray, and it's a different joy uh, when you're praying for, uh, for people with, that are doing well. Lord, I thank you for so-and-so and how much of a blessing they are to your cause and how encouraging they are to me. And you know that. There's people at church who are an encouragement to you. And, uh, and, and then there's other people you have to go encourage. And I'm not, I'm, that's not bad. But understand, they brought joy to Paul. And he thanked God upon every remembrance of them. Every time he prayed for them, he was praying with joy. Why? Because, Lord, just keep blessing them. Lord, they've given so much. They are such a blessing. And, and what a blessing that is. Always in every prayer of mine for you, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Word fellowship is, is important here. And uh, why is that important? Because fellowship um, is, Juan and, I, Juan and I talking last night at, you know, 9, 30, 9 and 10 o'clock about the ministry. And we're rejoicing in one of the people, one of the members who's growing so much and doing so well. And him and I just talking about the ministry. We're fellowshipping. We're in this, we're fellow. Fellow is the same. Shipping. We're, we're, we're enjoying the same things. We are together on the same team. We're the, uh, the Chiefs rejoicing when the Super Bowl. That's fellowshipping. Fellowshipping is when people are going together. And I can fellowship with a baby Christian who's growing, and I can fellowship with a very mature believer who's growing, but the fellowship isn't so good when it's ministering all the time. And he says, you know, since you got saved, we've been in fellowship. We've been on the same page, doing the same thing. You've been praying for me. I've been praying for you. You were eagerly receiving the Word of God. I was preaching you the Word of God. We were going, and you were praying for me, and I was in jail, and you were this, and, and we've fellowshipped. And, and, and when a church is like that, when they're striving together for the faith of the gospel, as the Bible talks about, it is such a blessing. Good fellowship with believers where you're, where you're we had this with the men yesterday at the men's prayer uh, lunch, and it just it's a fellowship and that's what it's supposed to be is is we're all lifting each other together and and boy when a church switches to people against each other or or just a few people trying to lift everybody it's not a good healthy thing but the fellowship's a good thing and uh from the first day until now they stayed uh fellowshipping and doing those things and uh and so he was uh you know the church is a blessing to paul and he rejoiced in them uh, next, um, he was confident that God would continue to help them. Um, verse 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. There's so much in that verse. It's such an important verse. And I think it's a verse that most Christians should have memorized. Um, Paul had confidence that it was God who began the work. And that's so important. It is so important to understand this church is God's church. This church is God's work. Your ministry is God's ministry. He began it. 
And he which began the good work in their lives will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. In other, in other words, God is going to continue to help them. He helped them. He helped the church start. He helped them get saved. He helped them grow in grace. God is going to continue that and do it because it's, it's, it's God who did it. Because Paul, look, Paul started the church, but Paul left. But it was God who began the work and God who will continue it. And that's one of the, uh, the wonderful things about doing God's work is we're laboring together with God. And we don't have to do everything. One of the things that, that I talk so often to pastors around, around, and it, it, around the world, and just what a relief it is to them so often, I remind them, it's not your church. You don't build a church. Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. It's his church. He builds it. And he, God began this thing, even though Paul was gone. And, uh, and so uh, things come and go, high times, low times, all this stuff like that. And, uh, but when God begins a work, uh, you know, he'll perform it. And God, God works in you. And he's not going to give up. And he will continue to help you through your highs and lows and, 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 and take you all the way there. He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Paul was confident in this. Even it as meet, which means worthy or desirable, for me to think this of you, of you all, because I have you in my heart. And so he says, you know, you know, you're there, I'm here, I'm in jail, but you know, I believe that God is going to continue this thing. And he says, you know what, that's what I want to believe, the truth is, because, um, because um, I have you in my heart, I love you. <coughs> Inasmuch that both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are partakers of my grace. You're partners with me throughout this process. So, you know, I really want to believe that God's going to continue to keep you going because you're very important to me. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in all knowledge and all judgment. And so he believes that God's going to work there. He's praying for God to work there. He is excited to see God work there. Um, he believes that God began that work in Philippi. He's going to help them continue it. And, uh, and that, you know, he loves them, and he, he really believes that God's going to help them and all those things. Then he goes and he gives them a prayer for growth. <coughs> and uh, verse 9, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. He's praying for growth. And this is uh, three things uh, uh, that he's praying for here, that, they're, that they, they would grow more and more. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more. So the first thing is he wants them to have more in love and that love would grow more and more. You know, it's a strange thing. I think we usually think that, that we get to a point of loving and then we're, we're there. But he says, I pray your love would abound more and more. You know, I just wonder how many of us love, and, and, and it's a good thing if you've grown from maybe some of you are really cold people and didn't have love to love into a certain point. That's great and praise God for that. But he's praying for it to abound more and more. And look, uh, the Bible talks about perfect love. And, uh, you know, loving like God loves. And, and, and do you love more than you loved a year ago, than you, than you loved six months ago? Are you growing in love? Um, do, do you have that? Because all of us need love. Love does so many things in the Christian life, and it's the greatest. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and without love or nothing. And he's praying that their love would grow more and more. And that would be a good prayer for each other. You know, if someone is cold or not being kind, why don't you pray that they grow in love? And, uh, and uh, he wants their love to grow. But another thing he wants them to grow, he says they're bound more and more in knowledge. He wants them to grow in knowledge. Knowledge is so important. Grow in grace and in the knowledge. Let's, let's, let's go to a second Peter. I want to show you how important knowledge is in the Bible. And, and boy, I want to, I just, this really spoke to me understanding this because it's kind of a, it's kind of a grief a little bit to me. And to many of you who've come out of Christianity with little knowledge, how often people come here and say, I've been starving. And, 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 and we're shocked because somebody will be going to church for five, seven, ten years, and the amazing lack of Bible knowledge they have. And how scary that is. And, uh, 
and, 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 and just how much we need to know the Word of God and how important knowledge is. And uh, they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. You can't just blindly worship God. you got to do it the way God says. You've got to have knowledge. And uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, and, uh, and uh, verse 18 it says this, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second Peter 1 and verse 3, according to his divine power, hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us unto his glory and virtue. So it said, grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says, God has given us everything we need in the Christian life through the knowledge of him who called us. You get that stuff you need through the knowledge of God. And, uh, and, uh, and, and we see uh, that again. And then in chapter 2, and uh, verse 20, it says, for if after they have escaped the, the uh, pollutions of the world through the knowledge of of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then they entangle themselves again. What an important thing this knowledge is. It helps us escape the corruption of the world. By the way, you say, I don't know how to overcome this. The answer's in the Bible. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. Sanctify through them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The knowledge of the Word of God and the knowledge of the Lord sets you free and always has the answers. The answers you need are there. But you've got to grow in knowledge. And by the way, please don't get this point where you think, you know, I've been saved 41 years and I've been going to church for 20 years. I know all this. You don't know all this. Okay? <laughs> I've said it before, but, you know, I've been studying the Bible every day of my life for 34 years. Like, literally. I went to college and earned a degree, a bachelor's degree, studying one book, okay? And I preached this thing for 33 years, okay? My life's been been around one book and around one person, and I still learn it all the time. The, the, The Word of God is the mind of God. It's infinite in depth. And to know the Lord. Look, we see through a glass dark, darkly a lot of times. And, and you, if you quit growing, it's not because you learned it all. <laughs> it's because you have spiritual problems. Either pride or laziness or, or something else. But it, you got a lot to learn. And I still have a lot to learn. And, uh, and sometimes, man, I, and by the way, I learned a lot in Philippians 1. I will have chapters uh, an entire chapter memorized uh, that I memorized when I was 17 and I'll all of a sudden see a verse and go, huh, I'd never see that before. I've had it memorized since I was 17, 10 years. And, uh, and, and still, still I'm learning and, 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 and things I've had memorized because you got to grow and there's so much in there. And when I grow in knowledge, let's go to 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. I just want to understand Keep on learning. 2 Corinthians 4. And uh, verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I want to say this, and, and I've always erred on the side of courtesy to other churches, and we've taken the high road on this thing. Uh, if they're preaching the gospel and people are getting saved, you know they understand how to be go, how to go to heaven. We don't pull, we don't try to compete for those members. We just don't. And and everybody's told me, well, if the church isn't as good and it's messed up in this, I know that. But it's just look, I'm trying to reach the unsaved and fulfill the Great Commission. Okay. And, and I've always taken the high road of the churches and, <clears throat> and their members and everything like that. But the truth is, okay, even though we'll take the high road, is most people are choosing churches the wrong way. When the knowledge of God is what's so important, then all they care about is the music program and the lighting 
<clears throat> and how hip the pastor is and how quick they can get out of church and how good a coffee stand they have in the church. <clears throat> how good looking the pastor is or how fun the entertaining the service is or whatever. Most of the time it's music is what people choose the church from. It's amazing. They'll go, how many times? I can tell so many stories, so many stories. Uh, people who come to our church and they said, that is amazing. I've never learned so much in a sermon. But you know, my, my, my church has got a rock band and I, I'm going to keep going there. <laughs> I would just shake my head and go, wow. Uh, I, I had a, a lady, she got saved in our church, got baptized in our church, and other churches don't give us the same courtesy. They recruit our members all the time because we have the new converts. And, uh, and we, we, we have hundreds of people in churches in this area that we went to Christ and and got, and then the other churches swooped in and uh, and got them. And because they're new converts, and new car, new converts are worldly minded still, and they offer them the worldly stuff. And uh, and and so um, this lady came, and then her friend found out she got saved. She said, "My friend found him a Christian now, and now she wants me to come to her church." And so she went to her church, and she came back. She told me, she "says You know, Pastor, this church has a, a rock band. It's my kind of music, and I just love that we jammed out the whole time." And, and and all this stuff, and I'm gonna start going to my friends. They don't understand how that affects us, you know, and all the labor we put into them. And uh, and and then she didn't see her for three months. She came back three months later, and she came in the service. And she came after the service. And says, "I just learned more. I forgot how much I learned here. I just learned more in one service than I've learned in the last three months." And I said, "Man, I'm glad you're back." And she said, "Oh no, I love my rock band there. I'm not gonna come back. But I just I just want to tell you, I just learned. I I forgot how much I learned here." And I just said, goodness, what a way to choose a church. Of course, it wasn't long. Uh, her husband had started coming to our church. He, he, he started a little bit, and he started kicking maybe four or five services over three, over three months. Uh, next time I met her, her husband hated that church, never went back, went once, never went back. And then he said, it's all phony stuff. And then later on, I met her again and never divorced. And, all that. and it's not all for a rock band. We would have reached her husband. Husbands like him, we've reached them a lot of times by God's grace, you know, and, and things. But but why do people choose churches for such shallow reasons? I mean, we had good donuts. I mean, you know, I mean, but but you can go, you ought to turn to choose a church where you're learning about God and learning the word of God and where God's using you where you can do ministry work. It's not all about who's the funnest and, and the hip pastor who sits on a stool and has a pair of you know, cargo shorts and a t-shirt. Wow, this is so awesome. This is so cool. It's not even like church. That's the problem. That's the problem. If you want to go watch a comedy club or go to the bar, go to the bar. Don't. But, <laughs> but, but, it's about the Bible. And, and, and look, that 25-year-old you think is so hip who wears his skinny jeans, which no man should wear, um, just understand, you really think that guy can lead your family because he's cool? How's that guy going to, what's going to happen when you're in an intensive care unit and your child's dying? And he's like, oh, because <laughs> he didn't know anything because he's 25, but he's hip. He tells funny stories. Yeah, he sells them off the internet. Notice there are none of his stories from his personal experience. Because he's a kid. And he's, 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 he's hip, okay, and he's, he's got big muscles. Wow, this guy's cool. <laughs> Look, choose a church by where you're learning the Word of God and where God speaks, where the Holy Spirit is, and, and, and where there's godly people. And you can have a 23-year-old who's godly and can teach you the Word of God. The point is an age. The point is, churches, all they care about is being hip now. And, and all they care about and is, is how much they can jam. And you know, these musicians have to pay them. <laughs> you know, those church musicians who are up there singing for Jesus, you know, if that church doesn't pay them, they won't sing for Jesus anymore. Just so you know that. They don't announce that, but that's the fact. And, and, uh, and, 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 <clears throat> And, and just understand, the most important thing about church is are you learning the Word of God? Is God using this church in your life? Are you learning to minister and becoming mature so you can be used by God? 
Because that's what it says in Ephesians 4. The church is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to a perfect man and the knowledge of the fullness and stature of God. Growth and ministry work. And pick it not by where you feel the most comfortable. Because sometimes a good church, you don't feel comfortable when the Holy Spirit's convicting you. And you're squirming. And that's good. Because <laughs> you need it. It's not all about comfort. And, uh, and, and so grow in knowledge. He's praying for them to grow in love and in knowledge and in judgment. Now let's go back to Philippians. All right, finish my rant. And in judgment. In verse 10. Uh, or in, in uh, verse 9, it says, that, that, And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more in, uh, in knowledge and in all judgment. In all judgment. Verse 10 talks about this. He improve, may approve things that are excellent. We'll get back to that in a minute. But judgment. Romans 12, 2 says this, that you may renew your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, acceptable and perfect will of God. Let me take you to Hebrews. This judgment thing is so important. Do you notice this? How little judgment even Christians have nowadays? The things they say, you're going, you don't know the Bible better than that. You don't have better judgment than that. It's amazing the lack of judgment. To able to judgment is the ability to discern right and wrong, and to make good judgments. Uh, in Hebrews, in chapter five. In verse 13, but everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a, ba a babe. But strong meat belong to them that are of full age, even by those who by reason of use have uh, by reason of use have had their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Notice that they're skillful in the word of God, so they have judgment. That's why good, wise counsel is so important, because people who know the word of God well have good judgment. And good judgment might be about a person. Good judgment might be about a financial thing. Good judgment uh, might be um, about many different areas in your life. But having good judgment, boy, you've got to have good judgment. He prays, I want you to have good judgment. Why? Because there's a lot of deception in the world. There's a lot of decisions we have to make. There's a lot of discernment we have to have about a lot of things, about people, about life, about decisions about ourselves, about seeing us. You have to be able to have judgment about your own life and where you are. Judgment's so very important. Let me go back to, uh, go back here into Philippians 1. <clears throat> He's praying they'll grow in love and in knowledge and in judgment. I hope uh, we are growing in these things. And then a, a cool phrase here, verse 10. If you grow in these things, uh, semicolon, that ye may uh, prove things are excellent, and that ye may be uh, sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Think about that phrase, that ye may approve things that are excellent. Who wants to take a guess at what that means? Ye may approve things that are excellent. Anybody want to try? Now you're all scared. But I'll think you don't have judgment. And, uh, but, uh, going once. Okay. Okay. Think of a stamp of approval. You may approve things that are excellent. This is, this is interesting because it's not the way... <laughs> Most Christians look at things. It's always, it always is kind of funny to me, but to approve excellent things. So when I first went to church, um, when we first went to church as a new Christian with, I mean, no knowledge of God and just, you know, nothing. Um, we just, we, we had, for whatever reason, we'd had the world and we didn't want that anymore. We wanted God. And so we wanted to go all in. And so we came to the Bible and we just looked and said, what does God want us to do? And God wants to go witnessing? Okay, let's go witnessing. God wants, and so we were just looking for the will of God. And then we started hanging around. Well, what happened is we, here's what, here's what happened. We went to public school. We went to public school and we started going soul winning at school. We found out there's a whole bunch of other Christians in our school. We just didn't know they're Christians. 
But when we started going soul winning, um, they all came out of the woodwork and said, wow, this is cool. We didn't, you, you guys are the worst kids in the school and now you're out witnessing. And, and, and this is, and, and they started talking to us and, and they, they started hanging around us and following us. And, and, and then they started taking us to a youth group. Well, then we started going to normal American youth groups with them. And we kind of got a culture shock because those kids were a bunch of punks. And here's what they always wanted to ask. Now, some of them weren't. There was a few of them who were very godly, who, who were, uh, let me take it back, they weren't godly, but they wanted to be. They just had no leadership. One of them was my wife. One of them was Pastor White's wife. They went to other churches, and they were in youth groups. They were worldly youth groups, and that's bad. I mean, the bad stuff went on. But they had hearts for God. And there was other kids, and a decent amount of them, who wanted to serve God, but they just didn't have any real leadership. Went to the youth groups, and we started hearing this all the time of the the teenage, because our lives were transformed. We were just growing and stuff like that and serving God and having a blast. But they would always say, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? And that was always a question they asked. What's wrong with this? And all they wanted to do was rise to just above the lowest possible denominator of, is this absolutely forbidden? Okay, then I'll go right there. And they never asked what was right or what was best. Their question was not approving things that were excellent. Their question was, what's wrong with that? And they're always going to the lowest denominator. And so we, man, we came out of the world. And we didn't want the world anymore. And, and, and we were like, you know, we don't, we don't want to, you know, that, that, that music, man, we, that's my old music. And I said, what's wrong with that? Where's the Bible say, thou shalt not listen to heavy metal? <laughs> and I always just going, it's kind of an eye roll going like, <laughs> okay, what are they talking about in the song? You're, you're trying to find, you know, looking under concordance under H for heavy metal, but it's not in there. Okay. And, and we didn't have rap back then because we had brains. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and so, and not that heavy metal is it extremely intelligent either, but, uh, you know, but my dumb is not as bad as your dumb. And, uh, but, uh, but, you know, we, we, we would, we couldn't always prove it. We're going, I just don't think Jesus wants me to listen to that. And it's a terrible testimony and nobody's, you know, we're different and the same from appearance of evil. And I don't know the Bible that way. You know, I could prove it better now, but back then like that, but it, why would you want to listen to something that doesn't glorify Jesus? Why would you want that old life? Why would you want to be friends of the world? And, and just that, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with this? And we found out that when you try to do the very best, and what does it say? It says that you may prove things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ. So when we did it, what 1 Corinthians 6 says, it come up from among them, be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing. We realized we had that distance from some things. And so we kind of stepped out and said, excellent. As it says in Romans 12, too, it says, uh, <clears throat> Be not conformed to this world, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so we said, man, I want to go to church every time the ch ch church stores are open. Man, I need a lot of church. I say, how many times the Bible say you have to go in a week? <laughs> and I said, look, we need to go to church a lot. You might go to church one, once a week and make it, but you know, we need to be there every single time. Do we make perfect and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ? We wanted to go as best we could serve God. We wanted, to, we wanted the, the music that glorified God the most. We wanted to witness so that we didn't have to wonder if we witnessed enough. We wanted to witness to everybody in our entire school. One of our teenagers in public high school, he witnessed to every single kid in his entire school, at least once. That's pretty impressive. Okay, we wanted to be on fire for God. We wanted to be separated from the world. We didn't want to say, well, am I right on the edge? Because we wanted to be without offense. Because when you're right on the edge of the cliff and you say, well, the problem is I shouldn't fall off the cliff. And so you live right here constantly and say, well, the sin is falling off the cliff. So this is, this is, this is okay right, right here. And the falling off the cliff is a sin, but I'll, I'll just see I'm not sinning. What's wrong with this? The problem is you're going to fall. And the problem is you want to do your best for Jesus, not, well, okay, what do I have to do? 
They're like the employee who always does the exact minimum. It's impressive how they can find the exact minimal line of the work they have to do to stay employed. You ever seen those employees? Somehow they stay employed. They know the exact line. But you know, I don't want to be that way for Jesus. I found out when you try to do the best for Jesus and approve things that are excellent, I found out you get called a legalist. And I've asked as a question for 34 years, where's a legalist in the Bible? And I never get the answer from that. <laughs> because if you want to do your best for Jesus, like if, you want to do, if you want to just be without offense and just clearly abstain from all appearance of evil, you're a legalist, whatever that means, as a Christianity calls it. And somehow there's some legalist thing in, in the Bible that isn't there. that had never, I've never had one of them show me that in all these years. And I'm like, look, I want to serve Jesus as best I can. I want to be as pure as I can. It's a weird thing. If you fall on the, lo- the side of being a little less conservative and kind of walking the line, everybody says, yeah, we need to be tolerant of each other. If you are careful and try to prove things that are excellent, the tolerance thing kind of goes away. Who do you think you are? You ho- think you're holier than everybody. That's... <laughs> I didn't say I was than anybody. I'm probably doing this because I'm not as holy and I'm kind of weak and I need to be careful. I always laugh. Let me take you, let's show you an example of this and just one example just to offend everybody. And uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And uh, so people talk about this and, and I remember having this conversation because I had, I had long hair. Can you believe that? I had a mullet back in the mid-80s when I was first saved. And uh, confess your faults one to another. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse uh, uh, 14 it says, Doth not even nature itself tell you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? And I remember, I got my hair cut. And I said, you know, well, I think God wants me to not have long hair. And they said, why'd you cut your hair? I said, I don't think I wants me to have it. And the Christians said, it doesn't say it's a sin. It says it's a shame. <laughs> okay. I don't want it to be a shame. You know, the next verse says, if a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her. Does it say she has to? I don't look at the Bible that way. If I was a woman, I would have long hair. Why? Because the Bible says it's a glory. But it doesn't say it's a sin not to have long But it's her glory. And God smiles upon it. It says, nature tells you that you should do that. I think a woman should have long hair and a man should have short hair. Does it say it's a sin? No, it says it's a shame. Jesus had long hair. <laughs> that portrait, Jesus, that is not a portrait. He was not sitting there for that. Jesus, just understand, he was painted by an effeminate, Italian, long-haired, uh, Renaissance guy. Jesus was not effeminate. He was a carpenter. In Bible times, you could not be effeminate. You had to be very strong. Okay? He was not Italian. The guy on the cross is Italian. Okay? He was not Italian. And that is not a portrait. Okay? You don't know he had long hair. It's because the guy who painted it doesn't know the difference between a Nazarene and a Nazarite. That's how little Bible they know. A Nazarene is a geographic location. A Nazarite is a vow. He didn't know his Bible well enough and said, oh, he's a Nazarite. He's from Nazareth <laughs> and thought he had long hair, okay? They don't know the Bibles very well. We don't know. Uh, uh, I, the Bible says it's a shame for a man. And I said, well, I don't want to be ashamed. Well, can you prove it with the Bible? <laughs> How about you just prove things that are excellent? Why don't you do the best instead of the, low, with the, the lowest common? Your Savior didn't go part way for you. He didn't do the minimal for you. And, and so I don't look at the Bible that way. I want to be able to prove things are excellent. In order to do that, to know what's best, what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God, I've got to have some discernment. What, does, what would be the best way to dress? What would be the best way to talk? What jokes would I have? Would there be no question if they're wrong? What would be the best way to glorify God? How would be the best way to, what would be the best for me to watch on my TV? Maybe that would be a better way to look at to prove things that are excellent and fill your life with good things instead of not trying to do just the minimal bad. What's the best I could do for the Lord? How could I bring in the most glory? Not how can I not sin? 
I think it would be better to, do, to live that way and approve things that are excellent. And the question should not be what's wrong with this, but does this bring glory to God? Is this the best I could do? Would this make God the happiest? And, and just when you, uh, heads up, when you decide to not be a minimalist Christian, but the best you can for Jesus, you're going to get criticism from the world and from worldly Christians. And you don't fight with them. You say, you know, all right, you don't have to do that. I'm not saying I'm better than you. God bless you. This is what God wants me to do. I'm just, this is what I think is best. And, and, and let them call you a legalist. Every once in a while, just throw, okay, can you show me that in the Bible? And then they'll go, you know, this is what they say. They say, you know, it's legalism. I know you just said that. Can you show me that in the Bible? It's being a legalist. Okay. Can you show me that in the Bible? That's legalism when you try to be too strict. Okay. Will you show me that in the Bible? And they'll go get their concordance out. And they say, okay, well, the Bible never used the word legalist or legalism, but, you know, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were unsaved people. They were, they were not saved. And they rejected the Messiah. Jesus told them, these things ought you to have done. When he's talking about them living right. Can you show me that what you're talking about when you just, you're, you're too holy and God says, oh, you're too holy, stay away from me. Will you show me that in the Bible? Because every time I see somebody in God's presence, they always say they're too unholy. I don't think God, I'm going to get to heaven and God say, you are just too holy. Man, tone it down, man. That's not what I see Isaiah seen in heaven or John seen in heaven. They see God and say, whoa, holy, holy, holy. Woe is me. I'm unclean. So I'm going to fall. I'm going to err on the side of holiness. But you can do whatever you want. I'm not. I'm not gonna, I didn't even say anything about what you do. I just, you asked me what I did. This is why I do it. But go ahead. Let's not fight. We're Christians. That's what I, that's how I do. I don't, that's what I do. They want to fight. I don't want to fight. I don't have time. I'm too busy trying to win the world of Christ to fight with them. But understand, approved things are excellent. Let me finish up with, with this. Philippians. And, uh, that you may prove things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus, under the glory and praise of God. You understand that we are approving things that are excellent. We're the, when we're a Christian who works in an excellent way, who lives in an excellent way, whose speech cannot be condemned, when we live in a glorifying God way and are loving and compassionate and busy for God and, and do things that are excellent, in the end, that life and the righteousness brings glory to God. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And to be therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus under the pray, glory and praise of God. And the end result always is the glory of God. And so live an excellent Christian life, not a minimal Christian life. <laughs> not, not, not barely making it, but glorifying to God. All right, we got we to gotta finish. It's late. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll, we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for the chance to teach your word today. I pray, Lord, that we would grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that we would uh, just uh, uh, become excellent Christians and uh, bring you glory. Pray this in Jesus' name.